I changed my prompt to you're not ready to let's get ready because I felt that you're not ready is so negative. We want to be positive when we deal with prod, right? Okay, so um, my talk is on chaos engineering and how to get ready. A few years ago, I interviewed for a job and the ask was to bring stability to the environment. It was for a company that was facing lots of incidents and stability issues and I thought, sure, how bad can it be? I, all I probably need to do is update their tool to the latest version, slap some monitoring to get an idea of what's happening, maybe worst case, refactor some code. I was wrong. Once inside, I realized there was constant nightly incidents, siloed teams, lots of red tape, and the support team that was tasked to stabilize the environment weren't the ones who built it or architected the infrastructure. When we think about solving problems in prod, we think our systems look like this. And sometimes we overcommit because we are unaware of how tangled it is. This is what we usually end up facing. Fires everywhere. I quickly learned the production environment was way more complex than I could have ever imagined and almost impossible to untangle. But a difficult prod is nothing new. We know 100% uptime doesn't exist, networks fail, applications are dead, there are firewall issues, and maybe the reason for my eventual death, application owner's code. If their prod environment wasn't scary enough, I also really didn't know where to begin to start poking without the fear that I might bring everything down. It made me realize that it is our job to ensure that the systems we are building are reliable and safe. But when we pull back the current, what we see is a lot of complexities and we see chaos. Each of these boxes is a server or a host. These lines can showcase the systems that are supposed to communicate to one another, but they don't. On top of all of that, our systems today are the most complicated they've ever been. Before we were able to map things out easily and see what could possibly go wrong, we would ship out code once a quarter, once a month. Today it's different. Our focus is more on innovation and there's a pressure to uh, execute with speed, which means we're moving way faster. We're going from weeks to days to hours to minutes. The, the systems we tested yesterday are not the systems we're operating on today. More importantly, sometimes we know things are broken, but we don't know how to fix it. There's a culture of fear. We fear we're gonna take down our whole infrastructure if we start poking around. If I touch A, will I break B? If we take a look at the basic principles of chaotic engineering, we may be able to start addressing some of these issues and maybe get to a starting point where we can stabilize prod. What is chaotic engineering? And what does it have to do with stability? Chaotic engineering is when you take a systems-based approach to address the chaos in distributed systems at scale and build confidence in the ability for these systems to withstand realistic everyday conditions. The idea is that we learn best about the behavior of a distributed system by observing it during a controlled experiment. The more we build confidence in our systems, the more it can withstand. The more it can withstand, the more we can poke, the more we can introduce chaos, and the more it can withstand chaos, planned and unplanned. This sounds like a great idea. Who would want to see our, how our systems behave when stimulated with real world events? But how do you know what your system can handle and how it will react? Especially if you have a finicky prod environment. I wouldn't want to inject any failures into this. I would personally be too scared. But that's what I was tasked with. I was tasked to stabilize the environment to make it more resilient. How can I fix something if I have no insight into what ch my changes will impact? And if I'm too scared of the failures it will cause? We can take a look at the principles of chaotic engineering to get us started. First and foremost, we wanna learn about what our vulnerabilities are and where they exist in our environment. So really, how finicky is our prod environment? We don't wanna wait for a fire to tell us what's wrong. If we take this approach and we take a look at the principles of chaotic engineering throughout this talk, we can take a look and determine these factors. We will talk about what a steady state is and what it is, what it is used to best utilize chaotic engineering without putting our systems at risk for total failure and irreversible damage. We will then continue the conversation by reviewing some principles of chaotic engineering and how it can benefit any environment, no matter how fragile. To begin, you need to understand what is your steady state. No matter what, if you want to practice chaotic engineering or not, I highly recommend defining your steady state. 
it is a good overall business practice. But what defines a steady state? What if you think your environment is steady and you start to jump into experiments with chaos engineering only to find cascading failures all over your system? A quick way to know if you have a steady state is to ask yourself, is your systems resilient to real world events such as service failures and network latency spikes? Go through your JIRAs, go through your logs. If you know that the answer is no, then you have some work to do before applying the principles of chaotic engineering. Defining your steady state is important, and you also have to be able to define what your system normal is. What is your normal? Your normal state and your steady state are two different things. If you're constantly putting out fires, then you're not in a steady state, and your definition of normal is one where your environment is unstable. Getting to a healthy normal state is what I consider pre-chaotic engineering. You have to begin by knowing what is working and what is not. Chaos engineering is great for exposing unknown weaknesses in your production environment, but if you are certain that chaos engineering experiment will lead to a significant problem within your system, system, then there's no sense in running that experiment. Your normal state is not steady and you will have to fix those weaknesses first. If your environment is always broken, you'll have to harden your systems to get to a steady state, thus changing the idea of what your normal is. Our goal is not to break anything, it is the opposite. We want systems running in prod that are resilient, that can stay up even when attacked. You need to know how your system fails, put that engineering effort into harden your system and elevate your normal to be one that is resilient. You have to get to a state where your normal working condition can withstand turbulence of chaotic engineering. Once you have a resilient working normal, then you can define your steady state. Your steady state and your normal should be at par. You also have to identify what level of steady your environment is. There are different levels. Before setting up any experiments, it's a good idea to evaluate your system and try to see which of the following buckets your organization falls into. If you were to inject a bug, what would happen? Is your environment what I consider fragile? If you were to poke anything, will it result in total system ruin? Which of the four are you? There's resilient, where your system is able to take damage, avoid total failure, and has the ability to recover. This, is, this state is what we usually see and is still a good candidate for chaos engineering. Then there's robust. Your systems are stronger, it absorbs uncertainty and effectively manages damage or avoids it altogether. Anti-fragile is the most stable state. It is able to respond to stress, maintain its health, and is adaptable to any real life problems. Knowing which level of steady you are will help you plan your experiments and also help you understand what your system can withstand. So how fragile are you? There are a few ways to quickly understand if you are fragile or if you are resilient, maybe even anti-fragile. Some quick questions you can ask yourself are, are you constantly putting out fires? Do you have incidents on a daily or weekly basis? Do you generally behave more reactively than proactively? Understanding how you and your systems will react when chaos occurs will help you better understand and prepare for it. Understanding which bucket your steady state falls into will help you gauge how well your organization can handle chaotic engineering. Obviously, the more robust and anti-fragile your environment, the more you're able to push experiments and poke your environment for gaps and bugs. To get a better idea of which bucket you fall into, it's a good idea to hypothesize how your system will, will react. If you were to inject failures, how would your systems behave? This is a great learning experience and since you don't know what will happen exactly, hypothesizing will help you gain knowledge on your system and explore the possibilities of what can happen. Clearly defining your hypothesis can easily help you determine if you're ready for a chaotic engineering experiment. It gauges how confident you are about your systems. We should take a facts-based approach when defining our hypothesis. It's important we don't make any assumptions. We should base it on documentation, past failures, and our personal experiences with our systems. We tend to know our systems best. We can also take a look at the quality of our current testing practices to predict how our systems will react if you were to introduce chaotic engineering. Chaos engineering and meaningful testing go hand in hand. To get to the highest level of availability and resiliency, you will have to have unit, regression, integra integration testing, as well as chaotic engineering practices. Testing will help, you give you, will help give you insight into your environment, where chaotic engineering will help you generate new information on how complex your systems react. 
I like to think that testing tells you how your system behaves or misbehaves, and chaotic engineering is designed to reveal weaknesses in your environment. Either way, there isn't about, this isn't about running experiments blindly and hoping things go well. Understanding your practices, uh, testing practices also helps you get a good idea of how well you will do with chaotic engineering. Just like understanding your normal, it's important to ask yourself, are we doing a good job at testing? I personally am not a tester, and this was probably the biggest lesson I learned. With chaotic engineering, we don't go into the system without thoughtful, robust plans, and a large piece of executing chaos engineering is planned experiments. We start with initial planning, we start with one host, one container, one server, and then scale up. We also agree that we don't start experiments in production. As we get to see how successful the experiments are, we expand our radius. We minimize our risk, we ensure there is a comfort level with the experiments, starting in a testing environment, and then later going that chaos maturity to run into production. And I know, testing environments are not the same as prod. And if yours is, I really, really want to meet you. Um, it's important to start in testing. So if you start to build your confidence there and establish a baseline of what is going on before moving to prod, it'll help you long term. These drills are better, they, they will help better prepare you for the chaos you're about to occur. All right, so testing gives us an idea of how much chaos our environment can handle. And chaos engineering identifies where our vulnerabilities are. But how do we know which systems are being impacted with our tests and experiments? Our hypothesis can only help us predict so much. Monitoring is then a crucial piece of chaos engineering. Just as you have to evaluate what your testing capabilities are, you also have to review your monitoring abilities inside your organization before taking on chaos engineering. You have to review if your monitoring abilities mean meaningful observability. With the current monitoring you have in place, can you see error issues? Can you see what your users are reporting or what your latency looks like? Or more importantly, can you see your blast radius? If one of your experiments, which are only targeting a few of your hosts, is now having a larger impact than what you were expecting, are you able to see, see into that insight clearly? It's okay that testing didn't go as expected, but to truly succeed from the experiment, you need insight as to what occurred so that you can now tackle these issues that your experiment didn't account for. If you're just rolling out experiments and only accounting for gaps that you <laughs> hypothesized, then you're missing a larger opportunity to stabilize and better your environment. Instead of getting an abundance of meaningless alerts, endless dashboards, trying to make sense of it all, your monitor should be able to tell you where the impact was who felt it the most, and most importantly, when to hit the big red stop button. Without monitoring, you won't know when your, what your blast radius is and what failures your systems are facing. I would also like to mention that monitoring, any monitoring tool can be used with chaotic engineering. I know there are monitoring tools specifically built to work with chaos engineering, but when you're starting off, I don't think you have to rebuild your monitoring practices to fit chaotic engineering. But instead, you want key components to monitor, and you could start with like looking at your pager alerts or your logs or your JIRAs to kind of get you and get an idea of how to set up your set up your monitoring, and then put your chaotic engineering testing to tie to it. Monitoring also plays a crucial role in identifying cascading failures. Cascading failures are failures that often lie dormant for a long time until they are triggered by an unusual set of circumstances. A bug is revealed. The software was making some kind of assumption and now all of a sudden stops making that assumption, causing errors across the environment. This is a big issue with chaotic engineering. So hence why monitoring is so important. If your system is resilient, it might be able to absorb the damage, but without monitoring, you aren't sure what other areas have been impacted and how these areas can cause chaos in the future. You need to be aware of all the damage happening in your complete infrastructure, including the errors you didn't account for. And it's important here to mention that failures that occurred because of your experiment is not bec because chaos engineering does not work or that it broke your system. That's incorrect. Instead, your culture has to be one that views it as there was a bug that could have been triggered at any point, but with chaos engineering, we're able to identify it, contain the blast radius, monitor and, ident and identify the potential impact, and now we can go ahead and engineer the fix for it. The bug was gonna come out no matter what. With all chaos engineering, we couldn't have been aware of the bug until a fire was caused, bringing it to our attention. This is a very reactive mentality, so we want to avoid perpetuating that kind of culture. That brings me to my next point, culture. 
which I believe is the most important piece of um, its crucial piece when uh, addressing chaotic engineering and to see if it's a good fit for your organization. Chaotic engineering has become a buzzword. Uh, I see blogs like titled Joy of Destru Destruction. We hear we break prod, we test and prod, and my favorite, we break things on purpose. When chaos engineering has a reputation and emphasis on breaking things, it worries me. It worries me because it's impossible to sell failure as a service to your stakeholders. As we have learned so far, chaos engineering is not cowboy engineering. Our goal is not to end up with broken systems, but instead to see what is vulnerable and how to fix it. It's crucial that your organization understands the foundation of chaotic engineering and knows it's not here to break anything, but instead to act as a partner in helping build systems. How your organization views chaos will determine if they're ready for chaotic engineering. So do you have a culture that will embrace it or will you be met with a lot of red tape? Some ways to understand if your organization can be open to chaos engineering is to ask yourself, are we proactively embracing failure? Do we have a culture of no blame? Are we reviewing our architectural designs and identifying where the gaps are and where, we can, where things can fail? If you're not currently reviewing your current state, then you likely aren't prioritizing your bandwidth on stability. You may, you may be in build mode or you may have, a you might have accounted, accounted for resources somewhere else. You can also look at your post-incident reviews as an indicator. Do you plan action items and execute them? Again, do you prioritize stability and resiliency? These questions can help determine how well your company will embrace chaos engineering. You may also, want, may also not want to call it chaotic engineering. I like resilience engineering, fragile system engineering. It's a lot easier to sell an idea without the word chaos in it. It's also a good idea to approach chaos engineering as an opt-in, opt-out model. I never push chaos engineering, but instead I try to approach those teams who are looking to opt in. As we work with them to set successful experiments, I then socialize those successes to the other teams and show them the value of chaos engineering. The idea is that chaos engineering is gonna be planned out. We start small. We're not gonna start off our first experiment on their first largest deployment. We also wanna ensure they understand that the failure is likely to occur inevitably, but we choose with chaos engineering, we can help better manage that failure with them. We want to perpetuate a culture where failure is, an okay, failure is okay, an inclusive culture that embraces failures and understands why failures help build better systems. So then if you have a steady state defined, you know what your normal is, and your normal is resilient and stable, you have adequate testing practices, you have monitoring um, to ma manage the blast radius, and you're committed uh, to start smart, small and your work culture embraces chaotic engineering, you would think you're ready for chaotic engineering? No. Communication and documentation. It's a crucial piece you have to have in place prior to, take on chaos, prior to taking on chaos engineering. You need strong architectural designs that define as a state so that you can see what your impact your experiments are having. Communication is key as well because chaos engineering is a collaborative approach and you need buy-in. Owners need to know that that experiment is running. If you don't communicate what you are doing, people will learn your name very quickly and for the wrong reasons. So I believe it's really important to advertise your experiments. Although there is a school of thought that may disagree with this and says you can't really practice chaotic engineering if you know it's coming, and that can be its own talk um, in itself, but they are wrong and I am right. <laughs> I'm just joking. It's just another school of thought, and this is a good time to explore how you want to run your chaos practices, depending on your own organization. With strong testing, a culture that embraces failure, communication, documentation, and monitoring, you should see more stability in your environment. Chaos engineering ensures your priority from the beginning is to build resilient systems. Understand and untangle your prod, get to a steady state, and harden your environment to always withstand fires. You should slowly start to move from a fragile environment to a resilient one, to a robust, and eventually an anti-fragile environment, where your environment responds to stress by automatically mutating. It's able to maintain its strength and can also adapt to change without causing failure. If you don't have, um, if you don't have the foundational pieces mentioned, then you're not ready for chaotic engineering. And I know that's a hard pill to swallow. All these cool companies are doing it. Netflix, Gremlin, but not everything that these companies push out are great ideas for you. For example, Google Glasses. 
We don't always have to buy into that new shiny object. Sometimes it's better to define our normal and develop practices that work for us and our organization. But if you are comfortable with practicing chaotic engineering, then go ahead, inject failures into your system. We have showcased that chaos engineering is not a blocker and it is there to help elevate your releases and better your environment. So we're getting more comfortable with chaos engineering. What kind of experiments do you wanna start with? With Chaos Monkey, you can terminate virtual machine instances, inject latency into requests between non-critical services, submit fail requests between services, fail an internal microservice, make a small region uh, which is backed up unavailable, just to see what happens. These are all great examples of starting with Chaos Monkey, but the mo most crucial part is starting small. It's important to track your lessons learned, take a systematic approach to chaos testing, don't wait too long to start load testing and load test your system constantly so that when you get to a mature state, you feel confident and can withstand full chaos engineering. Your system can now withstand these failures because you've identified that your system is resilient, maybe even robust. You are now ready to start planning more complicated experiments. For example, now you have the risk appetite to turn off multiple hosts, change firewall rules, review recent disruptions and recreate them. You're able to go bigger. This will showcase your organization's growing appetite for chaos engineering. This will test your documentation as well as your com uh, company's ability to communicate. It will cha challenge your testing practices you have in place and it will test your organization's culture. I remember one time like I was running a chaos monkey and one of my line of businesses asked me to turn it off for a large deployment. So it shows that they weren't ready to scale at such a level. If you pass, then we continue to get a little bigger each time. Set up experiments in dev and maybe even work your way to prod. You can recreate things that have already happened. Just ensure that you have a rollback plan. Um, there's also, like, as you get more uh, familiar with Chaos Monkey, you can also move to um, Latency Monkey, Janitor Monkey, Conformity Monkey, and so on and so on. But no matter how anti-fragile your environment becomes, I want to um, stress the significance of containment and blast radius. In order to control your experiments, especially if you want to move to prod, you must follow some of these best practices. Communication, communication, communication. Share knowledge and get buy-in. Start small to disprove your hypothesis. I believe you need to run it during office hours where SMEs are available, where you can avoid important dates and also have a rollback plan. Reduce any unnecessary risk and shake the image that chaotic engineering is too risky. Evolve your team and stakeholders as to why there's system gaps and then permanently fix them. Also get familiar with the different tools that chaotic engineering offers. But no matter what, you have to recognize failures are inevitable, no matter how resilient your environment. We need to take calculated risks and if you plan accordingly, we should end up with better systems. We want to have confidence that our systems can withstand fires. Over time, the more we test, the more we poke, the more we fix our environment and the more our systems become resilient. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger, except for bears. Bears will kill you. So please manage your risk and manage your experiments accordingly. There is one more final step in the principles of chaotic engineering and that's disproving your hypothesis. Go through your evidence and see if your steady state was impacted by the experiment. If you found something, then this would be the time to go ahead and fix it. It is important that you prioritize this work. It's important to work in an organization where you're encouraged to take ownership um, in bettering your system. If we are using chaos engineering to help identify all your system issues, then it's also important that we go ahead and permanently fix those issues. This is great because you're bettering your system and your systems will be in a better state each and every time to withstand more chaos. Eventually, the more you disprove your hypothesis, the more anti-fragile your system becomes. Um, my name is Susan Mehboob and the slides will be available on my LinkedIn and I will share it with the organizers as well. And I thank you so much for listening to my talk.